And welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. Great to have back on today, Jay Height from the Shepherd Community Center. Jay, how are you doing today? Doing great. How about yourself? Doing well, doing well. So if longtime listeners to the podcast will remember, Jay, uh, when I think of the term kingdom entrepreneur, um, Jay's picture is like right next to this. And every time I meet with Jay, in fact, we had a great opportunity to connect uh, just within the last week or so. I have my laptop open and I'm ready to type because I know there's about to be a bucket load of ideas coming my way. And so I'm just grateful for your work there at the Shepherd Community Center. And Shepherd Community Center has been um, in the near east side of Indianapolis since 1985, started with a simple but staggering goal. I love the way that you, you frame that, to break the cycle of poverty on the near east side of Indianapolis. And so Shepherd has a number of different initiatives. We'll link to their website in the show notes. But I wanted to catch up with Jay today to think through uh, some recent developments as we're trying to engage our communities. We talked about a number of things and want to bring some of that information to the audience. So Jay, would you jump in just a little bit about kind of your current position, background, and what what Shepherd is doing? And then we'll jump into some of your current uh, ministry initiatives. Yeah. um, Actually, July uh, will be 27 years that my wife and I, Jane and I, came to Indianapolis to serve at Shepherd Community and have for over 25 years served as the executive director. And so God has blessed us in tremendous ways, and we've seen tremendous growth as we continue to try to help families break the cycle of poverty. I think the mantra we use today is we want to grow capacity to reduce dependency. Um, It doesn't make any sense for us to make, uh, make folks codependent on us. God created them, each of us, with a plan and a purpose, and we have to help folks recognize that and help them achieve that. That's And it's so encouraging. I think of the book Toxic Charity with anybody that's spent some time in this space is familiar with that you don't want to hurt people by trying to help them, uh, hurting by helping, in a sense. And I, I appreciate Shepard's model and how you're very strategically trying to help people in a crisis situation, but then help lift them up, give them dignity and help them help themselves in a sense. Uh, would you share maybe a recent story or success from the, from your ministry, anything that comes to mind? Well, I think I'm reminded multiple times about those who we've served who now serve with us and are my wow. colleagues. I think that's one of the things that I am blessed to be able to serve with those uh, maybe it, you know, for Jane and I, since we've been here a while to see that student that we worked with who now comes back and serves, we have a young 16 year old working in our kitchen this summer. And this was the little guy that was three years old when he was in my wife's class. And he is, uh, he's had a struggle with cancer in his life, but mm-hmm. he's still in school, still moving forward, wants to do culinary arts. And we're excited to have him helping serve lunches and learn from that. Um, I'm, uh, I, I think of just so many. Uh, one who leads our child care center. We opened two years ago an early childhood center. And this was a mother who had brought her kids to our programs and said, hey, I'd like to help in your, um, your early childhood. And we said, well, go get your associates. And she did. And she said, I'd like to teach. We said, go get your bachelor's. And she did. And she said, someday I'd like to run the place. And so she went and got her master's. And so just a few blocks over in August of 2020, we opened the Mini Hartman Child Care Center, which works with 60 to 70 kids. We're hoping to double that now in the next coming months as we come out of COVID and expanded capacity and and as we hire new staff and get them in place. And um, I, I think that um, Diana is, is a hero in many ways, but she's a mom who wanted better for her kids. And now she's helping moms help their kids have a better way. And, uh, and so those are some of the exciting stories that uh, help me each day know, hey, we are making a difference. Well, that's, that's encouraging, that's encouraging. To, uh, just to hear people that came through and now actually giving back and serving themselves. Uh, just so for first our listeners that are hearing about Shepherd Community for the first time, I do encourage you to take a look at their website. But Shepherd 
very strategic and is thinking through how to help people. And again, that, that catchphrase of reducing dependency, growing capacity in areas such as faith, health, uh, support, stability, skills, models, advocacy, knowledge, future, and income. So things like addressing food insecurity, um, education, a lot of really interesting uh, things they're doing there with a, a computer lab where kids can do STEM type of work and then get credits for these gaming computers, uh, just so many different uh, efforts there. And so Jay, I want to kind of start at a broader level and just ask you how current economic developments such as inflation, rising gas prices, how is that impacting your efforts to impact the, the neighbors there in your community? Well, inflation is a disproportionate tax on the poor. And despite what some politicians will say, um, it's all of our responsibility to help. Um, and decisions made in DC do have an impact on our families. Our families are paying in the Near East side 40 to 50% of their income on housing, 38% on food, 26% on gas. And I haven't even got into uh, medical, uh, utilities, uh, you know, you got to have something to put that gas in vehicle. The numbers don't add up. Yeah. And um, maybe because I'm old, I'm 56, will soon be 57. I'm, I'm getting more cynical in my old age. Grumpy, my wife might say that uh, I think um, I've had conversations with our Congressman Carson and with Senator Young, and they both had some good ideas. Um, but at the end of the day, the way we weather this storm of inflation and food inflation is going to be with us for some time. And I'm talking years, not months. And, you know, I'm not a economist, but I think folks would agree we're probably heading into a recession or a recession like time. And all of these pressures uh, are really uh, going to be disproportionately impactful to my neighbors it comes down to the simple phrase, love your neighbor. We, the church is the tool that God created to help in these times. And if I can buy a few extra groceries and share it with my neighbor, if I can make an extra pot of soup and share that with my neighbor, if there are a, a litany of ways that I think in very practical ways, but it comes down to let's be what God called us to be, and that's the agents of love to our neighbor and loving them. But it starts, Josh, with us knowing who our neighbor is and being able to uh, call them by name. And uh, I had a privilege this last winter. I have a neighbor who can't drive. And so he, he and I, I got to be his uh, his Uber driver, right? Uh, uh -huh. Taking the grocery and, and um, you know what? I got to know him very well. And uh, this is a guy who um, society would have written off and, and would define him by his brokenness, but God's doing a work in his life, and uh, he has felt all that rejection, and uh, it's, it's my job to know him by his name, call him by name, and engage on a daily basis in his life. Uh, that's what we're called to as Christians. And I do appreciate that about you, Jay, and that every time I meet with you, you have all these very high level strategic initiatives, but then you're still engaged personally in, in loving your neighbors and making a difference there. So you, you, we mentioned this kind of catchphrase, how to increase capacity um, and reduce dependency. Will you dig into that concept a little bit more? And, and how are you going about that? How are you serving your neighbors without causing dependency? Yeah, I was working with a friend of mine who runs human services in the state of Tennessee. And we were, uh, he had interviewed a lady and she said, every welfare program keeps me from drowning, but no one teaches me how to swim. So that's really our call, right? Yeah. Is to teach people how to swim, is to come alongside and help them. Uh, in, at Shepherd, we have 10 assets that we believe every person needs in their life. And we want to help build those assets and measure our effectiveness by how we're building assets in our neighbor's life. If it's just how many widgets that we make, you know, that, that outputs are not what we're about. 
It's not about how much tonnage of food that we're distributing to our neighbors. Yes, we distribute food to our neighbors because that stabilizes them. But if we stay there, then we develop a, a dependence that we become their grocery store and that's not our uh, goal. We want to help them grow their capacity so that we can help them spend their money better on their food, help them know how to eat healthy. I mean, it's expensive to eat healthy, right? Uh, most of us shop. If you want to eat healthy, you shop in the outside of the grocery store. If you uh, don't have a lot of money, you shop on the inside aisles, the canned food, which tends not to be quite as healthy. Um, but let's help our families figure out how to eat as healthy as possible. And, and create that access to healthy food, but knowledge of how to use that healthy food. One of the parts of Shepherd Community that I, I was gonna blown away by was the, the kitchens that you have there that you, you can actually have individuals come in and learn how to, to cook, um, have a recipe and, and create a meal. And I thought, wow, that's such a practical, just hands-on way to serve people. Yeah, my wife wants to sign me up for those classes. So maybe I <laughs> do something more than microwave, but um, cooking's a lost art. Uh, we've we've uh, lived in this microwavable meals, which tend to be high in sodium. Number one killer in my neighborhood's high blood pressure. And so every time I give you a can green beans, I'm giving you stuff that's been high in sodium. And so um, we need to help folks learn how to cook healthy. Um, and for some of our folks, they do know how it's just in getting them access to the right food. So you mentioned those 10 assets, uh, maybe you don't have to run through all 10, but I think it's helpful uh, for listeners to hear just kind of how holistic and strategic you're trying to be there. So would you run through some of those 10, um, those 10 assets that individuals have that we could be encouraging our neighbors to develop? Well, one is faith and it, you know, any secular sociologist will say that faith is a key component because it helps you develop a resiliency to deal with the challenges of life. Faith helps you um, have that internal fortitude strength to continue on. And, and so we don't force you to accept our faith to be served, but we want you to know the hope that we have within us. We believe it makes us different and how we live and exist and, and that it is not power over, but it's strength beside. The foot of the cross, we're all equal. And, and so uh, faith is one of those. Um, I think another one is, is to have this um, future orientation, to think that I have a future. One of the reasons why violence is so prevalent in our cities is people have lost their future orientation. They don't think that they're ever gonna grow up because everyone they know is either in jail or dead. So might as well have fun and do whatever I want in the meantime. And that leads to a very destructive lifestyle. Uh, we would say the least of the 10 assets is money. Government has based welfare off of uh, me giving you stuff. Well, stuff doesn't change anyone. Yes, money does have a purpose to play, but without the rest of the assets, you, you cannot use those resources in the appropriate manner. And so, um, you know, Josh, I can send you a short video and maybe you can make it available to the listeners that we yeah. demonstrate uh, using Legos because it's, it's about building that bridge from um, a, a broken life, a life in poverty to a life with upward stability. And that's a key difference. We want folks to have a stable life, a life not measured by how much stuff you have. Some of the richest people I know have very little and some of the poorest people I know have a lot. And so uh, we don't measure it by money, but money is uh, a tool that they can use. Uh, you know, health is, is one of those that uh, we wanna help our families have this asset of health and access to health care. Uh, we don't want it to always be focused on sick, sick care. We want it to be health cares. So how do we help our families make good choices? And a lot to think through there on uh, those kind of 10 assets um, that we have and, and how we can encourage our neighbors uh, to, to jump in. And again, we're just there to be a partner, just to, to be, to support them as, as they develop this future mindset and, Speaking about the faith piece of this, you've shared with me a couple of times a story about the war on poverty. And I think it was in Martin, 
County, Kentucky. And when I think about the, the role of the church in impacting neighborhoods and even impacting our state, I often think back to this. So would you share that story? Sure. I had the privilege. It was 50 years to the week. So I think it was eight or nine years ago. I stood with some pastors on the same porch that Lyndon Johnson declared the war on poverty. There's these iconic photos of him squatted down talking to Tom Fletcher, the unemployed coal miner with his kids in the background. And one of those kids now, Calvin, who is in his sixties and lives in that home said to us, and uh, he says, government's promised us a lot, but nothing's changed. We still don't have running water. We don't have electricity. Could the church help us? And we've heard a lot of criticism of the government and the failures on the war on poverty. And I don't discount that. I would probably agree that government has spent millions of dollars, even in places like Martin County and not moved the needle because they viewed themselves in just the, the money. But I think the other part of it is, is the church said, okay, well, it's government's job. We'll let the government do it. When that's exactly what the church was created for. Government can't love its neighbor because it's an entity. It doesn't have neighbors. The church can. The church is not a building. It's not a location. It's not an address. It's people. And um, we get caught up in saying, okay, well, government's supposed to do that, and we'll outsource it. We'll send people to come to our church who need food down to the local food bank. And I said, you've outsourced your compassion, and you can't do that. You can't tell folks, well, you know, that's not what we do. We're here to meet your spiritual needs. Jesus met all the needs. But I fear, just like in the story of the Good Samaritan, um, we, we're guilty of being like the priest and Levite, who we're so busy doing ministry that we don't have time to minister. And I, I had this own indictment of me. So my neighbor... He has some health challenges, and whenever trees fall down in his yard, I, uh, limbs fall down out of this tree he has, I go pick him up, and we have a pile in the back, and I was hurrying to work one morning, and he's out there, and he's like, oh, this big limb fell, and my first reaction was to say, hey, I can help you tonight, but I got to get to work, and then I thought, okay, you hypocrite, um, and so there I am helping him. And I, I, and I know I'm feeling anxious because I, I, I've got a meeting I got to get to. And that's the Levite and the priest. We tend to demonize them when I, I think it too many times I've been that in my life. And so I stopped and I said, I'm sorry, Mark, let me help you. And we, we got to working on that and, and it put me a few minutes late, but did it? Or was that what God wanted me to do in ministry? Mm -hmm. We consume so much time in, in meetings and planning when Jesus said, go and be. And uh, that morning, Mark needed me to help him move a limb. And that's what, where Jesus was. Yeah, that, and, uh, yeah. That's definitely convicting. I, I have kind of two thoughts. One, wow, that's, that's convicting for all of us. And then the second thing that you mentioned, and had not thought of it in that way, but that Jesus met all the needs in the sense that, First of all, spiritual needs, but then food, healing the sick, uh, caring for the poor. Um, so you're right that he he was preaching the good good news, but he's also doing good works that showed his the, the power and beauty of what he was teaching. And so I had not thought of it that way, but that's that's a beautiful way to frame it. Yeah, I so, mean, he he was connecting. He, he, we're all Legos created for connection, different shapes, different sizes, different colors, and we're made to create to connect to God, like a Lego does on the top. I'm sure you've got kids. So you've stepped on that Lego in the middle of the night and you say, oh, bless you, child. Uh, thank you. You know, uh, a Lego by itself is useless, but when it's connected on the top and the bottom, you can build wonderful things. And that's what God did for us and for the communities. We got to be connecting. And Jesus always connected. Uh, it was ministry at three miles an hour, not 50 miles an hour where we live. Hmm. He just was walking. And, and here's the thing that I'm guilty of that uh, if you've had the privilege to watch the Chosen the video series, when you see the actor portraying Jesus, when he's talking to someone, they have his full attention. And he's, they are the most important person in the world at that moment. 
and and I hope that when I'm engaging, whether it's my bride, whether it's my children or grandchildren or my neighbors, that they feel like they have my full attention and that they matter to me because everyone mattered to Jesus. He didn't heal everyone. And even those that he did heal, they died. So either his his power was temporary, which we don't believe, but it served a different purpose, per, sorry, a different purpose, which was to connect. He used that to connect, right? Mm. And and so it's not for random acts of kindness. It's not for us to airdrop compassion around. It, it's for us to use this as a way to connect to people. But connections take time, and that's what God created us for. Ministry at three miles an hour. Well, we, we might as well just end it here and have an altar call. <laughs> at least I feel like I need one. Uh, so these are all encouraging and, and convicting thoughts. So I wanted to continue. We're, we're talking at a somewhat higher level, and then we're going to jump into a few more specific um, initiatives you have. But I was really encouraged to hear about, I believe, what's going to be called the Center for Human Flourishing um, in Tennessee, and perhaps something that other states could could learn from as well. So would you explain what's going on there in Tennessee? Yes, we're working to help them retool the safety net in the state of Tennessee in the Department of Human Services. And so working with Treveca Nazarene University to create the Center for Human Flourishing, where we can train faith-based organizations, we're training uh, human service organizations, as well as uh, those in college preparing for work with human services to understand about the asset building hmm. and how do we help folks? We, we don't believe that as some do that for every problem, for every dysfunction, we need another program. We don't think that's it. If you look at all the federal programs, it's billions of dollars and it's, it's just scattered across. Nor do we think it's survival of the fittest. Uh, you and I are both would be described as pro-life and we're pro-life from conception and we're pro-life for children. We're pro-life for teenagers. We're pro-life for adults, pro-life for senior adults. Uh, it's, it's from conception uh, all through life. And, and so for us, it's how do we help folks who maybe have a struggle to flourish in their 20s and in their 30s so that they don't get sucked in by the hydraulic of welfare. That's encouraging. And, and there's a, a particular individual, I believe, that worked um, in uh, a presidential administration on this issue and is now working in Tennessee on this. Yeah, he's the commissioner for human servicing for the state. His name is Clarence Carter. He's a good friend. He, in the last administration, he ran TANF. Uh, he ran human services in Arizona before that. And then before that, he worked with the Bush administration running SNAP or food stamps. So he's operated for several governors, um, two presidents, and um, has just a litany. His whole career has been in this human service uh, field. So he brings a vast array and he really wants us to work alongside and, and many others to retool the safety net so that welfare doesn't become a hammock, but it becomes a trampoline that it catapults people out and doesn't capture them and hold them in. When you shared that with me, I was so encouraged and I'm going to be praying for this and looking forward to, to seeing it come together. Uh, what a remarkable opportunity. I'm so grateful that you're now able to use your you know, 25, 27 years of experience, even just in Indy, been doing the work longer than that, um, and that you have the opportunity to, to kind of pour into this particular effort in Tennessee, and we'll look forward to seeing how that develops and what lessons we can learn from that effort. Yeah, we hope to be able to do the same thing here in the state of Indiana. We, we believe that this is a unique opportunity to have an impact and there's a lot of great folks out there doing amazing stuff and we want to help consolidate that but it, the problem is welfare by its nature is just it's it's a need focus and we want to see it as an asset based uh, and so i know we've spent a lot of time talking about just how to formulate this but i think having the end in mind and you know having these guiding principles you're you're pouring into people helping them build their own assets not just serving their needs um, how you formulate that 
And then having that faith component, I, of course, as a, as a Christian, I believe that's absolutely critical in helping people um, get through difficulties in life, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm encouraged by all of this, looking forward to seeing what's going to happen uh, there in Tennessee and in, here in the state of Indiana. So I wanted to go to a couple particular issues that you're working on that when you, you shared them with me, I kind of perked up, well, that, that's interesting. And one of them has to do with the mental health crisis. And over the last couple of months, we've had several episodes just exploring this, what's going on, who are the, the Christians that are engaged in this, what are some things that we can do? And I believe you're working on a tool that could help with mental crisis, uh, the me- mental health crisis, and specifically young people. It has to do with virtual reality. Uh, so would you share what's going on there? Yeah. Uh, so I got to meet a guy from USC who runs a, a lab there that works with the military using virtual reality to help and this is Jay's explanation, retool the synapse of the brain for those in the military dealing with PTSD. And using the virtual reality, they're able to reduce the level of PTSD in them. Well, we wanted to see if we could extrapolate that to what they call ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. ACEs is how you measure a child's uh, trauma. And we've seen a huge increase tragically in the last um, many years uh, because of COVID and all of those types of things that ACEs scores for kids have increased. And that leads to a a more high risk lifestyle. What we wanna do is see if we can bring that technology and then partner with some friends at Purdue who have a VR lab up in the Northwest part of the state to build this out and test it with kids to see if we could then open source it to schools and youth serving organizations and churches and things to uh, allow them to deal with the mental health challenges of of youth at a time when we don't have enough counselors. And this doesn't replace a counselor. It's just another tool in the toolbox to help us um, address it. Fascinating me for a couple of reasons. One, I love all things technology. Uh, But just sometimes what I have found in this work is sometimes the state puts together this great program. You got lots of resources, you know, new marketing materials, everything's there, but then like nobody shows up, (laughs) you know, and so to help people, they actually, you know, have to have the incentive to come and participate in the program. And I was just interested that you could almost use the a child's, a teenager's fascination with technology, with gaming, and just an inclination to, oh, look, here's something new. And that that could actually assist with these, um, these adverse childhood experiences. And so I was just fascinated by, by that developing. We'll look forward to seeing that come together. One other thing that you mentioned to me, and again, I, whenever I leave Shepherd, I'm just thinking there's all these innovative things that you're doing. And then there's some just very boots on the ground, very basic human needs. And then, so you recently opened a laundromat in your church building uh, if, if I understood that correctly, it's, would you explain what led you to do that? Well, we're in the process of doing that. Okay. Um, yeah. Not quite where uh, September is the opening date. Okay. So my wife and I have for two years through COVID delivered food to families in the neighborhood each Wednesday morning. And, and so we've learned a lot. I've learned more in that than the 20 plus years I've been in the neighborhood because on the mm-hmm. front porch, you learn a lot of things about people. And um, we know that if you're on food stamps, uh, you can't use that for diapers, laundry detergent, soap, shampoo, feminine hygiene, none of those items. And so those are very precious items and and expensive items. And so we have a church here in Indianapolis that provides us with laundry detergent. And I delivered it with my wife to one of our families. And she said, well, that's great. And she has a little boy, her husband works construction. She said, I can't afford to do laundry. And well, it's been years since I've been to a laundromat. So how much is it? It's six dollars to do a load of wash and then two dollars to do to dry that load. So eight bucks. If you got little kids, you got a husband doing construction, that's a lot of laundry. And and she with inflation as it is, and we've already gone through the numbers, they don't add up. Yeah. Uh, she's in a quandary and so what uh 
in talking through that, I thought, okay, how can we meet her need yet not make her dependent on us, right? We don't, we don't want to replicate that. So what we're exploring is the idea that we would install uh, industrial washer, commercial washers and dryers, and then she could come do her laundry, but she's either volunteering here and whoever would use it would, or they'll take classes because we, we want to grow capacity, right? While reducing dependency. And so we want to use this as a vehicle that we can do that. Well, and I love just back to the idea of why did Jesus serve people? He did so to connect with them. And right. I mean, they're going to be, if they're at a laundromat, they're just, you know, sitting there waiting for their, their clothes to wash and dry. And this is, they're on your campus. You have a chance to minister to them and, and perhaps they can give back as well. So yeah, I, love, I just thought that was a great example of being connected to your neighbors and them identifying a need and then you re responding to that. So for the pastors out there, and I've actually heard of other churches and ministries uh, beginning to do this. Uh, so maybe that's just one idea if your church is interested in, in serving in this way. I also uh, was just blessed by the way that you're encouraging our elected officials. And when I started this work, and I began talking with pastors and ministry leaders about building relationships with elected officials. I kept hearing, hey, you need to go talk to Jay. You need to go talk to Jay. And so I know you have strong relationships with elected officials from the federal level down to the state level. And so what are a few ways you're encouraging those officials to help reduce stress on families as uh, we, we're facing these economic challenges? Well, number one, I, I uh, want to respect and honor them. And um, I don't always agree with them and they don't always agree with me, nor does my wife. So <laughs> it, it, that's just how life is, right? Uh, but we need to view them in honoring them, regardless of what party they're in. Jesus was not a Republican or a Democrat. And, and, and he has called us to honor those in authority, pray for them, which I take very serious. I want to encourage them scripturally. And then I want to help paint the picture. I have one elected official who calls me periodically and he'll say, tell me what main street's like. And what he's saying is mm. what's it like for your family? Oh, wow. And so we need to paint that picture and help inform them so that they, as they make decisions that they're hearing from the very granular part of their uh, elected um, constituents. And I don't want to beat them over the head um, in private. I may have very strong conversations about issues, um, but I also want to be very private, private in those. And, and in public, I want to continue to encourage and support and honor. That's such a powerful example of what we're trying to accomplish. And I love that thought of you're telling them what main street is like. I actually just got off a call with a pastor kind of explaining what we're doing and, and how, Certainly, pastors can learn from government officials, but also the government officials can learn from pastors and saying, oh, you've talked about that problem. Well, that problem has a name, and here's what happened on Tuesday and what's going on. It And I've found that it's that part of the conversation with government officials, that they'll kind of put everything down, you know, start taking notes, because it's really helpful for them as they're also trying to serve the community. So that, yeah, that spot on with that, I, and I appreciate your example in and that relationship, you're not afraid to have those hard conversations, but that's done in the context of a strong relationship and a foundation of respect and love. And so what are, I, I believe there was at least a, a request out to the city about um, some of the swimming pools and ways that even families that are, are you know, you, you talked about just a couple of needs. And I think, and I, I didn't go to school for math, but I think that was over a hundred percent. And so they don't have a lot of income ways that could re reduce stress this summer yeah uh, uh, in our conversation with the mayor just painted the picture for him of what the neighborhood's like and my concerns and and i encourage them to explore the idea of making pools free this year because even just a couple bucks is going to be a huge stress and i appreciate that uh that they made that happen they're under a lot of pressures uh, they're struggling to find enough employees to be able to staff the pools um, but they prioritized the urban communities and they made them free and so i, I really appreciate 
Mayor Hogshead and his team in making that happen. Um, that's the type of thing that we need to see uh, continuing to happen and, and for folks in each level of leadership for them to, to make the practical decisions because as you alluded to, the statistics that they talk about and they vote on have names and faces and they're my neighbors. And so it's my job to personalize them and help them understand and to see sometimes the unintended consequences that we don't always see in our actions and our decisions, um, but have huge catastrophic impacts sometimes on our neighbors and helping paint that for them in a way that again, honoring and, and uh, helps them want to listen. So encouraging, and I, I imagine that the pool budget is probably kind of a rounding error on the city. So it's probably just like, you know, it wasn't that big a deal for the city, but nobody had thought of, hey, this is a great way to serve families that are, are facing an increase in inflation and gas prices. Well, I think sometimes we forget that whether it's, it's our mayor, our governor, our congressman, our city councilor, our state rep, state senator, wherever you're at, or our senators, we tend to forget that they're people too and they have families and, um, but they have a unique perspective, but it's a perspective that sometimes is limited. And so we need to help broaden that view in an appropriate way, uh, not to prostitute our neighbors, that's, that's not God honoring, but to help them see that. And so uh, we, we appreciate the, the great response and um, it, it's a very practical way uh, it's not the solution, but it's part of, and, and many times we have to be willing to, to, uh, be, to celebrate the partial solution. So I'm, I didn't have this in kind of the list of questions that I teed up beforehand, but just as we've been talking and I'm just blessed by your example, I was, was interested. You've been serving there for 25 years as executive director. And as listeners can tell, you're not, you've served there faithfully, but sometimes I think that word faithfully can kind of be used as well. You're still hanging on, you know, <laughs> you're still hanging in there, but not just, you know, faithfully. And I think that's actually the wrong uh, definition of, of that word. Uh, the faithfulness has a direction and it's forward, um, but, but energetically uh, continuing to serve there uh, after 25 years, looking for ways to impact the newest crisis and understand what's going on. Um, so any, any thoughts on how you, there's some endurance there, maybe even some just habits or practices, or, or how have you been able to do this uh, for such a long time? And I'm thinking of pastors out there that have pastored in the same place for, for 20 years, and I'm seeing the same people, and I'm seeing the same problems. Uh, so any thoughts or encouragement for them? Uh, yeah, I think, well, let's go to the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. And it, he describes each of those individuals is blessed hmm. and the world would say it's blessed because you don't have problems you're blessed because you have health you're blessed because you've got stuff and you you've got money uh um the word is macarios it is to live in a state above all of the worries and concern That only happens when the Holy Spirit has, has, is fueling you on a daily basis. And so, because Jay gets cynical and Jay gets tired and, and Jay, all of those things that he, he says, here's what the world tells you how to act. That's what the law was about, but I'm going to tell you how to react, right? I want to tell you how, when life has been rough to you, how you're going to respond and it's counterintuitive, but it only comes when powered by the Holy Spirit in our lives, living that life. And it's a daily decision to, it, to start my day in the word and to allow God to speak into it and to die to myself. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says it's for us to come and die. And I think that's how we have to live. This isn't about a career. It's not about who I know. It's not about the growth of our budget or the number of staff. 
It's about the effectiveness and one more life today that can understand the Makarios that I understand, that they're blessed mm. because there's a God, despite their circumstances, who loves them and can infill them and give them the strength to live. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for sharing that. That was a, an encouragement to me. I, I'm sure it's going to be an encouragement to others on the podcast. So I well, sometimes end with a billboard question. I just wanted to ask you, any other thoughts or suggestions uh, for listeners, pastors, other committed Christians that want to make a difference in their community? Just any kind of closing thoughts or suggestions? Yeah, I'll do this quickly because I I do a whole message on this. The power of the Good Samaritan is in three things. He had the eyes to see, which means we got to get off our phones. We got to uh, not be doing 50 miles an hour. We got to have eyes to see, the courage to stop, and the will to act. And and I think those have to be the mantra as we live our lives. Eyes to see, courage to stop and the will to act. Amen. Well, I appreciate that. And Jay, thank you for taking the time today uh, to share this with us. I know you have a lot going on. We'll continue to pray for, for you and for Shepherd Community Center and uh, look forward to continuing to work with you on making a difference in Indianapolis, the state of Indiana and beyond. Uh, so thanks again for all that you do. Well, thank you. And thank you, Josh, for all that you and, and the Daniel project is doing and, uh, and the hope that you bring into the lives of Hoosiers.